Dang, amazing. Oh, wow. Wow. Good to see you. Rabbi Landis. I know, but can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Beautiful. Okay. Okay. Hey. So at the very least, we'll talk. <laughs> that is a blessing. Wow. Good to see. So what is your, um, how come I can't um, text you? I don't know. Do I have, the, is there a, I don't know. Well, let's say it again. I was trying to te text you, and I don't know who sends it back to the 054 number or something. We'll figure it out. It's all right. It... People are facing worse problems. This will work out. <laughs> That's good, right. Thank God. Okay, so this is great. And Ethan is on. Great. Have you, um, do you go by, Rabbi Danny Landy's or Rabbi Daniel Landy's? We <laughs> use Danny under the occasion. It's fine. Um, Nothing else has worked for me. We'll try that one. <laughs> um, how is Yashrut? Are there, is it? Um, We're doing great. Mm -hmm. I mean, basically, I've pioneered this uh, online. Most, most of the time, medium have learned with me in person. Then there's other, and so for them, it's just a continuation. Right. Others have not, but I get to see them periodically. I mean, that's the, uh, I don't know if it's a totally viable idea. In other words, they're all advanced. They don't take right. anybody yet who's not advanced. So they've learned other places, they learned a lot. So in any event, so then I do stuff online and then I meet with them. I travel, I meet with them. So whether or not that's, that component's gone right now. But, uh, but if anything, I get more, I'm getting more to meet them all the time. Oh, fantastic. So business-wise, we're okay. Good morning, Ethan. Good morning. Good morning to both of you. The sound quality is so good. Yeah. Right, what it takes to get us together, huh? <laughs> exactly. Should have pandemics more often. <laughs> well, Matt, careful what you wish for. Yeah. You know, I think this is the, uh, I don't know, again, my rabbinical, it's kind of like it's the dam, you know? You think it's bad now? Wait for the other stuff. Mm -hmm. Anyway. How are things over there in Yerushalayim? I don't know, you know, the world's gotten real small, like uh, the contours of your of your room. But, um, but I can't get over really is that, because I always judge things on the basics, the basis of my very worldly and sharp uh, mishpacha. But most of the, a good number of the Haredim here have no idea what's happening. I mean, now they know, but they can't put it into any context. Like, epidemics, you know, uh, 
I, when uh, we made Aliyah, the first, uh, first family uh, wedding we were invited to. And uh, for a long time, we were invited to a lot of family weddings because we gave good checks. So we were invited, you know, we were invited. The first one, my son Isaac was uh, seven. And he met his family, cousins, who looked at him and demanded he say Kriya Shema, let's make sure he was actually Jewish. He refused to. But anyway, they were talking about family and there was some resemblance. He said, after all, we all have the same genes. Isaac seven. A lot of these kids were 10, 11, 12. Some of them are very prominent Rosh Yeshiva now. And they all said, no, we don't have genes. <laughs> <laughs> don't have genes. <laughs> you haven't read the Kuzari? Jews don't have genes. So, you yeah, know, this is already from the smarter part of the family. So, I don't know. You know, so I talk to people and they, they're pretty, uh, they're also terrified. But then you have a Muna. I mean, this all, I mean, it's like what people write, but, but it's really part of it. Also, they're not used to, you know, they're used, they're used to only certain type of hishtablis, you know, hishtablis and the ritual, but also hishtablis with negotiating with uh, the current, uh, current manifestation of the czar, which is Israel. You know, they don't know how to do that, or they don't know how to do that kind of political thing. Mm -hmm. It's kind of negotiation business. I don't know. So it starts with denial, I guess. It's denial because I actually just can't believe it. Then it's negotiation because that's the only one of the few modes. It's a disaster. It's really a disaster. So, I don't know. Yeah. Is is it going to be, um, by the way, uh, I'll just say technical. I, hopefully, uh, Dina will come on in a minute. I did this as a webinar format. So, hopefully. Which means what? What does that mean? which means uh, people can't uh, nudge or call. It's just the panelists talking. Um, All right. But, because uh, I didn't want to get a, Z a Zoom bomb, you know, Zoom bombs. It's like a big, been, I think, oh. a big issue that I read about. Um, and okay. Uh, but I don't know who's on. I, I, <laughs> oh, you can't, even you can't see who's on. You know, I look at participants. Um, no, and... Um, yeah, it should tell you who the, what the participants are, no? Because a webinar lets you get up to 10,000 people. Mm -hmm. um, so I apologize. I, I hope there's a big crowd looking. We are record. Is it okay to record? I think I saw. Yeah, why not? Um, so worst comes to worst, we'll just be one hour. It won't, we'll be recorded, if, if, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, let me just make sure I'm going to text uh, Dina again. I'll be right back. Just getting a Great. water. Um, Rav Landis, do you think this will, um, will this be like a reformation? Will this be like a big change in the way the Haredi community views itself? Yeah, except for those individual 14 year olds who say, this is really fucking crazy. Right. I don't understand it, but the, it'll be some like that. But no, they 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 have so they figured this out. They figured out the theology as such that and 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 you know this one of the areas they have show great hishtablis figuring out why it's not no reality is not reality. So it's actually I think the only thing that will do it is turning off the spigot of cash. Force right, people right. to even worse poverty. It's a terrible thing to say. Right. Uh, but that's, that doesn't seem like that will happen in the... Uh... No, I mean, you can't get even get Gantz and Likud together. So how can you... They're getting together, maybe. Um, is there a password or you just have to had to accept the panelists? I just accepted it. There was a password in what you sent out. 526358. I didn't need to use it. Five two six three five eight. I didn't, uh, but I didn't use it. Great. 
Dina has been in touch with I'm in touch with her, so we'll see she Good morning, everyone. Hey, wonder. Okay, well, <laughs> wonderful. At least they know we're your panelists. Um, People are trying to get in. They said that they can't. So what, what do you recommend I do? Oh, so maybe that's the, the uh, 52635A. Um, okay. Oh, dear. Okay. If I do X. Uh, let me see. Because I, I, heard, <laughs> I heard last night that Zoom started requiring passwords. passwords. That's what happened. That's what happened on Thursday if, if Judah tried to get into the Zoom fila. That's okay. I'm giving the password. It's okay. fine. We don't... fine. Thanks. Rev Landy's gave five two six three five eight. Okay. Oh, it might be a couple of minutes because I'm giving it out. Three five eight. You know, let me send this out. Um... If you send it to me as well, I can I can share yeah. it. It's uh, 526358. 526. Sorry, one second. Oh, okay. Sorry. I'm feeling inadequate here without a bookcase in the background. <laughs> oh, no, this is just the only way that, the only <laughs> zone where my kids will not. <laughs> People are going to think I'm Believe an artist me, no, I, or something. You know. That's amazing. I, I, yeah, I'm not doing the artwork thing. Um, I'm sorry, Rav Asher, one yeah. more time. Uh, 526358. Oh, it says incorrect. Okay, let me. Oh, no, but that's what you sent me. Okay, they so sent me? try it again. Actually, we have three attendees already. Okay, let, let me. me see. Uh, Let's see. No, okay, so my thing says this is my personal password. One second, let me just say um, James, could you ask her to try it again? Yes, yes, it does. I have the same thing. It says this link is not to be shared. It's unique to you, but I have the same 526358. We have six attendees already, so. Um, how come? Hmm. Oh, I, I gave him the wrong one. 526358. Okay. Nathan, how's your how are your kids doing? I get in. I mean, uh, the one at Kinneret has one more day of school. The others are done now. Yeah. Um, we will learn if that is better or worse. <laughs> um, yeah, but uh, right. so far, Bigadol, other than snapping at each other, you know, that's <laughs> really what, they snap at each other. Yeah, it's uh, it's okay. <laughs> So everyone, we're uh, just, um, uh, we have our panelists here. Um, I see there was some issue with a uh, password. Well, if you're hearing me, you know the password. It's 526358. But we already have uh, uh, eight attendees that have made it through. So we'll just give people another uh, uh, two minutes. Uh, and I just sent it out on, on, I guess, this secret password on my Facebook page. But... Um, so um, it's webinar style. So we're just going to get to hear from our incredible uh, panelists. Uh, but um, really, uh, if you um, have any <coughs> questions, there might be a place to ask <coughs> questions. Uh, I'm tr trying it to balance the old uh, Zoom, bomb Zoom bombing issue. And uh, so um, we're uh, 
trying to be as secure as possible. So we'll just give it one more, one more minute. Ravasha, the chats, people could chat their questions, right? Is that? Yeah, I see some. Lauren has just yeah. said. Makes sense. Thank yeah. You. Yeah. Oh, great. So the and chat. Thank you, Lauren. Oh, great, great. The chat room works. That's great. And Karen Lovinger, there's a chat feature on the bottom. Okay. Yeah, okay. This will be I can't, okay. That's great. Great. Okay, I'm sending it out to some other folks. Great. Okay. Let me just check on this. Oh, okay, good. So we'll, we'll just give people another minute. I'm sorry. Someone also, yeah, it's just asking me on our Facebook page. So yeah, what I just give them that yeah, same give it six out. digit. It, we're secure. Maybe they can say something nasty in the comments, but yeah, yeah. The five two six one. Hey James. Five two six three five eight. Five two six three five eight. Can you just send that out? Five two six three five eight. That's the password to get in. Well, they have the Zoom number. I think they just have to put it three five eight. Yeah. So these are, I yeah. just, someone texted me that they're just new, these are new security measures from yesterday. Everything changes by the day, as we know. So, um, another thing. Um, There's a request to send the password to WexNet. Oh, great. I'll, I'll do that. Great, great. Thank you. Just have to find where that is. Okay, I just great, great. Oh, well, wonderful. I already have a good, I already have a minion, so uh. Good. But, um, it's but a I, I, on after it. There's a machlokas on that. Yeah. There is. <laughs> uh. I don't know how we were, what they expected. To do with the new password. Okay. Um, great, great. So let's, I apologize. Well, let's give it till 9 10. And then normally Zoom, everything starts right on time, but uh, we'll, I, I don't want to, my fault for not giving out the password. No, it's, it constantly is changing. There's nothing. Have you, uh, uh, Ravdina, have you had uh, issues with Zoom bombing at all or? Um, in SAR, there are issues with Zoom bombing, really bad, actually. Right. Um, um, not in our shul, not in our shul, but um, it those, not that I know of, not that I know of, but, um, but there were issues there, and I can tell you my mother-in-law, who's still in Florida, um, mm -hmm. she did some, she was, there were some shirim that were to be given, and unfortunately, there were some anti-Semitic um, Zoom mm -hmm. bombing that took place there, so um, they've been very mindful of that and they instituted the password that, but now Zoom is actually kind of the default is a password. So right. that wasn't what they had. Right, so I guess when we sent out the invitation, it didn't- Yeah, you didn't have that. That's what I'm saying, it's counseling. And, and on Thursday, if Judah tried to get in, right, he's been getting, he probably couldn't get in though because they get, I had to change the whole Zoom system for right. our tool. Right. So wow. it's, it's, it's helpful, but then there are sometimes glitches that people have to be you know, you know, flexible with, so. 
Um, and I apologize, sometimes my email, uh, my Wi-Fi goes in and out a little bit, but um, it's, um, it, but it doesn't, usually doesn't freeze up terribly. Um, so just keep talking if I'm not, uh, I'm sort of unstable, as it says. And really, I just really, our panelists uh, and, and everyone listening, I'm just so excited that, you, that you're all here. I, I want to start, but give it one more minute, because um, um, I think we just sent out the password like a couple of minutes ago. And I know everyone has Pesach cleaning. I really appreciate so much coming on this uh, today. We'll, we'll go till 10 o'clock. So uh, if you want to give uh, two, three minute, uh, whatever answers, whatever you feel is proper, we'll just, uh, we'll, we'll give everyone equal time, God willing. And if you just got on, we're just going to start in one more minute. Uh, just to let everyone get on. We've sent it through to different networks. The, uh... oh, yeah, okay. One second. Great. Okay. Oh, wonderful. Well, uh, so uh, I am so excited to bring together three incredible uh, scholars who are dear friends and mentors, and I look up to them. And uh, as many of you on this call, uh, on this uh, webinar do, uh, I, uh, for security, you know, normally I've been doing Zoom, and uh, uh, but um, for security reasons, I've just tried to do, a, as a, do it as a webinar. Uh, and uh, so um, if you uh, feel passionate about some questions that you want asked, I don't even think we'll have time for all the questions that, uh, we, uh, that I sort of sent out ahead of time. But if you do, uh, then you can definitely uh, chat, put in the chat, and I will uh, do whatever I can to, uh, to read them and to uh, integrate them. Um, so uh, really, um, uh, welcome, uh, welcome to everyone around the world. Uh, and we have Yushalayim Yerach Kodesh, Jerusalem represented by Rav Danny Landis, who held, heads up Yashrut. Um, I'll give each of the speakers, our, our esteemed panelists, a, 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 however much time to talk about their own institutions, what they're doing. Uh, we also have uh, from um, New York uh, City, um, I believe, uh, both in, in Riverdale, but uh, also Manhattan. Um, so uh, Ravdina Nyman, uh, who's uh, not only a mentor of mine, but of my children also, uh, and um, heads up an amazing uh, shul minyan called the Kahila, and she's also an esteemed teacher, um, and uh, she's, she will incredible, incredible person, also um, uh, headed up uh, the uh, very well-known minion in New York, KOE, so it's wonderful to have Rav Nyman here, and Rav Ethan Tucker, uh, who, um, thank God when we lived in New York, we got to really be very close to, and again, um, his, not only is Ethan a mentor and an inspiration, but his children are an inspiration to our children, and we're all friends, so uh, really, um, uh, uh, Ethan, Rev. Ethan Tucker um, heads, uh, is one of the leaders of uh, Mahon Hadar, of the Hadar Institute. And uh, these are incredibly thoughtful people. And um, I'm just thrilled to have them all together. Uh, and so uh, we're going to start. I want to touch on some issues that have come up uh, so much. <laughs> some of these issues, I think, seem maybe... Uh, you know, small when compared to the bigger question when people are dying, when people, you know, huge pandemic issues in our world, but they're of concern to people, um, I believe. Uh, and so we'll deal with actually some of the narrower Jewish halachic issues and then the broader 
halachic issues that that have uh, implications for the world. Um, so, um, if I could uh, start, and um, I will, um, uh, I'll start with the question that I'm really struggling. Many people are struggling with what is uh, the halachic view of. Uh, some of Hilchot Zoom, of going on having a Zoom Seder, uh, of using Zoom on uh, Yom Tov, or, and in the future, what are we gonna do with this? What are we gonna do if this is communications, uh, what uh, of the future or of the next few months, and who knows, um, how, do we, how do we deal with it? And especially, um, how do we deal with it at this coming up for, for Pesach and, and all the other uh, understandings? So, um, let me start with uh, your shalim with Jerusalem, uh, Rav Landis, and uh, feel free to say a few words about uh, about Yashrut also, please. Nothing about Yashrut. Okay, so Yashrut, we use electricity during the week, for sure. So a lot of our classes have always been online. Basically, it's a smicha initiative for advanced students. But in any event, we do other things as well. Uh, so electricity, Zoom, do it really fast. I grew up using electricity on Zoom. We kind of kept it quiet. But uh, after the Orach HaShulchan, Yechiel Michal Epstein wrote what he wrote in the late 1800s in the Orach HaShulchan, the electricity is okay. His, he felt actually that it was fire. But then others who continue in that direction, not thinking it was fire, a chemical reaction, understood it as something out of physics, but kind of used that as a model. My great grandfather of Sri Pesach Frank, the, the chief rabbi of the, the Av based, the rabbi based in, of Yushalayim, had a classic article already in 1935. His uh, his cousin, who was a member also of the chief rabbinate, had it a few years later. Litvox, Betty Litvox, quietly used electricity. And the notion, the, the question was whether they, would turn it off. We're Bechaba. We generally were not would not uh, turn off the electricity. So you have that. But we never listened to TV, uh, radio. We never watched TV. I mean, that was ridiculous. I, mean, they even, I have to say, it even come didn't even come to mind to do uh, to do such a thing. So yeah. So in terms of the that part, there's always a notion of minimizing all the stuff that you do. And therefore, I'm not, uh, I'm not bulking in all the things with Zoom, but the least amount, but you're going to figure out. So if you ask me real clear and carefully, if the Zoom falls down, can you put yourself back on Zoom? I pass can for sure you can put yourself back on Zoom. The thing that bothers me most about the Zoom is a from thing, a religious thing. It's really, it's not technically an uvda de when we when we use it in Yom Tov for a Zoom uh, for a Zoom Seder, it's not a weekly, a, mm-hmm. a, a weekly thing because they're using it for a mitzvah, but it's so enticing. The one thing about Haredim, I thought they had it right. Suspicion of computers and networks, and I think they're still right about that, and especially on Yontem. So if you use it to call your, your mother, or your father. Now, one more thing. It's not just for mother, father, the Zoom Seder, but also, and some of the posts came from the North African community. One of them told me this part of that what was in his mind is all the children that are not on the derech, are not on, are not necessarily so religious, but that Pesach with the grandparents, Pesach even with the parents, is so important to them. You cut that off, you're really cutting off a lot. So I'm for, but it's like, you know, it needs a leash. You're muted, Rav Asher, you're muted. Uh, Rav Nyman, thank you. Rav, Rav, Rav Dina Nyman, how do you think about this? How, how do you ap- approach it? Well, maybe um, even though my father was educated in the Litvish community, <laughs> I would say that we did grow up more in the Hasidish world, I, like my father certainly did and his family. And um, electricity was definitely something that was viewed and taught um, certainly along the lines of the Chazonish and others as, 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 a, as a malacha. Um, and later on in, in my life and learning, et cetera, um, I, I, and I think I continue to be t- 
taught that way. Um, um, even though there was always a suffix, whether it was, right? So clearly that's not the case. Later on comes from Shlomo Zaman Orbach, right? So I, I, I'm totally skipping what uh, Rav Dan said, um, but he's absolutely correct in terms of what, uh, what the Orach HaSholchan said and others, um, that if you look at it, it's really not, uh, I mean, everyone tried to justify, is it Bona, is it Mavi? Like it, no one really could qualify what electricity was. Um, and I was very comfortable with what Shlomo Zaman Orbach said, uh, Rav Shlomo Zaman Orbach, when he spoke about it as Uvde Dechol. Um, and it seemed that way to me. Now, now one can say that maybe Zoom doesn't constitute Uvde Dechol. I can tell you someone who's using Zoom all day long um, during the week, it is Uvde Dechol for me. It does feel not Shabbos stick, quite frankly. I do feel that it's something that we be mindful of, just like when you say like no one would ever think of turning on the TV, you know, you turn on Zoom and you think what that would be. But of course, if you're talking about a case of someone who is, um, and certainly the calls that I got in my shul, oh, to talk about my shul is the Kiel of Riverdale. It's a wonderful, wonderful community that Rav Asher um, used to be such an incredible member in. And um, we've been graced by um, Rav Ethan um, occasionally here and there. And of Danny, you're welcome to come. <laughs> this is in Riverdale. Um, but, um, but in our shul, a lot of the questions that we've gotten more than, you know, we want to bring our families together, which was something that I really thought about. And that I'll say that about that in a second. It, there really are people who've never done the Seder by themselves. There really are people who've actually, who are actually very much alone. And it's, it's not, when you say pikuach nefesh, I mean, it, this is really, when we talk about the mental isolation that people are feeling right now, even though people are doing deliveries, for a three-day yantif, and, and often I found that sometimes that anxiety doesn't come at the end of yantif, it actually can come at the beginning of yantif, when people have this anticipatory anxiety of what's going to actually happen going forward. And given that, to be able to set up a Zoom session um, for those individuals, I feel if you set it up, that would be something that would really be prudent. For those people who are feeling, and I, and I would say it's for those situations, for those people who will, thank God, be able to have their insular families and be able to have, or even a couple who feel that they can have that mo those moments together, I would say that it's, it's not as... Um, it, I feel like Uvda Dechol, it's one of the three guitar, you know, it's like Muksa, it's like Tuch Shavis, right? It's not, it's not a small thing because I see it as Uvda Dechol. Um, there has to be a need to, to shift that over, I would say. In this climate, though, um, given what's going on, and you have to really weigh each case by case like you do on anything with Alacha, if a person is saying, I really need this, and this is something that really will matter to me, um, then we make that happen. Um, the case that my, my teacher of Sperber, um, brought up was a case of the grama issue. If you hold that it's not, if you hold that it's something more like electricity issue, um, which he, I didn't have an answer for. Um, but what I would say is if the need is there and you have someone who's there to help you, um, who uh, most people don't have anyone in their house right now assisting them. If you have an older person who's living alone, who has an aid there, I would say they certainly can turn it on and let that happen and be there for them. Um, so that it doesn't get canceled, like, you know, if someone's on the other side of things, you can, um, you know, do it with a little bit of a shinoya difference. I think that you could do something like that. I think it's very preferable on the second day yantif, where you can definitely do amir la'akum. If you have people who could do it, I would think that you could do something like that. Because um, second day yantif is different. I mean, you don't have to deal with that in Eretz Israel. But I think that that would be something that would be um, very, very prudent. And I think it could work very well, especially a check-in um, to have second day yantif right before Shabbos. Um, and that's also another way um, to do it. And I saw Rav Asher that, that you had spoken about, like having your phone on and things like that. It's not only about Zoom. Um, let's say like a phone call or something like that, that you arrange um, somehow to have that happen. I think that that's very important in terms of not only someone's calling you in dire straits, but something like this, Uvda Dechol definitely gets pushed aside when you have an opportunity um, to be there for another person. So I'm looking at it case by case when people are calling me, but I, I am saying if you feel that there's a need and you feel that the community, uh, there's someone in your community who needs it and you can be helpful, that you would do it. Wow, very powerful. Th thank you. And and Ravithan, if you, Ravithan Tucker, if you can uh, 
first of all, just, just mention uh, how, how are you doing and Machon Hadar and uh, also shed, shed some light on this. Uh, you know, is this going to open up a can of worms kind of thing? Yeah, so, and thank you, Rav Asher, for uh, pulling us together for this. And really, uh, I feel very much uh, katonti with my fellow panelists here, but, you know, and, and I'm privileged to, to be a part of the discussion. Yeah, I spend, spend most of my time uh, at Hadar, uh, Beit Midrash, uh, primarily in the United States, but growing stuff in Israel and network of people who have uh, been part of what we're doing that continues to grow. Oh, always happy to talk about that and share that and you can see see online some of that. Um, yeah, you know, I, I think a, a couple of thoughts on this. I mean, w one of the things, this is a sort of framing comment for me of everything we're gonna talk about here. Um, I think uh, there are some people who are approaching the current moment as if it is a kind of hurban abayit. That is to say, we had this paradigm, now we're in a new world, we don't know what to do, we're like thinking like Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, um, and my own sense is like that's actually the wrong frame here. I think we're in the butal hatamid of the chashmonaim. That is to say, there's a finite period of time where something is being suspended. Um, there are certain things we can't do normally, um, and that's very disorienting. And in that sense, I kind of find myself, while still wanting to do all the things that everyone has said about meeting needs and certainly anyone who is vulnerable being addressed, um, resisting the desire to uh, kind of reshuffle the deck or being very careful to sort of remember, okay, what's the day after going to be even, even in a circumstance where we have to be like this for a year or two sadaram, what are the things that we sort of see on the other end of it? So I don't know, it's sort of, I, I find myself with some of these questions being simultaneously more strict and more lenient in terms of my instinct. There's a part of me that's like, well, there's gonna be a day after, and if we don't want computers at our Seder tables, <laughs> then we shouldn't have computers at our Seder tables this year, and can we break down what is it we're trying to do, right? In other words, if this is about being concerned about someone being isolated for reasons of danger, so obviously you reach out to them. Another sort of klal I've kind of given some people, I'm like, if there's someone you would never leave alone for 18 hours without calling them because of concern for them, you gotta call them, right? Like, but that's presumably been the case for weeks now, right? In other words, you confronted that last Shabbat, you confronted that you know, throughout the cycle of this. Um, and on that level, it's sort of like, great, that's, that's the standard that you know, I think we have to emphasize. But assuming, we are talking not about that, uh, but we're talking about general, uh, you know, I don't know, feeling bad about not having the Seder together or some sense of like, isn't this so tough? Can we alleviate it? I don't know, checking in beforehand, doing the hour of convening on the screen before and then convening afterwards. I actually feel like there's some degree of building up that resilience to the difficult situation that we need to. That's the part of me that has this sort of strict instinct of, can we break down what the concern is and locally and minimally address the concern? And then there's the part of me on the other end, Yom Tov Sheni already came up, where I think we're actually a little, a little too strong on the other side of this. And this is something I, I wouldn't particularly be deeply upset if it got normalized uh, sort of going forward. If someone really feels there's some uh, deep isolation, let's say, right, a, a mental state that is equivalent to or more than someone who has a ke'ev naim, which is the standard, you know, an ayek is basically the standard for doing a darabanan on Yom Tov Sheni, uh, the idea that if you think, and I too come from a tradition where we did not treat electricity as a malacha and had that, that not over the top use of, uh, use of electricity on Yantav, um, that it's like, okay, if you think it's like the chazonish, so it's a, it's a circuit completion, that's another story. But if it's something that you treat as a durabanan and the other ephemeral you know, appearances of images on the screen and hashmat kol and all the other issues that are there, you think are durabanan, um, I would much rather, quite frankly, people be turning on a computer and initiating a Zoom thing on second day 
then except in cases of huge need, having something running even before Yom Tov on day one. I'm not trying to minimize, you know, the powerful sense that people feel of, but for the Seder, I'm supposed to convene. And in no way I'm trying to minimize cases where there's a real concern for, you know, even if not someone's safety, that there's a like holy kola goof or any number of other things that rise to that level. I don't know. I just also want us to be thinking about, as you said, what's, what are the boxes we're opening and, and trying to refill when this is all over? Oh, thank you. And, and I'm uh, relieved because we're actually uh, doing a Zoom Seder on the second night uh, when the second day comes in at, at 9 p.m. So I'm um, glad, uh, glad, glad to hear your, your, your views on that and, and everyone's views. Um, if I could shift a little bit, but a little bit um, uh, touching on sort of how long this is going to be and, and is this a change? Is this a sea change? Um, uh, Ravdina, um, you were, uh, you run a minion uh, regularly uh, and you've been doing daily minyanim. Uh, well, I'll call it minyanim, gatherings uh, that my family has participated in and, and really loves. And we've even recruited other people to come in from Chicago. So um, what are your, so one is the technical halachic issue and, uh, uh, and the other is, you know, how does it feel? Is this something that is just putala tami? We're going to get rid of it. As soon as we can get out of it, we'll get rid of it. Or is this something that, you know, maybe not? Maybe this is something that is a meaningful kind of gathering. So when we initially, there, there are a number of people in our community, like many communities, saying Kaddish. Um, there is one person in particular who lost a spouse and is, you know, it's Shoshim Yom and then that's it, you know. Um, and there was a real, for some people, it was, you know, a, a sense of relaxing, you know, like, uh, you know, the, the, the tension of someone who's going to Minchamarav, uh, Shachris Minchamarav every day, right? And they have to get there and um, there's this um, and that was a part of their routine. And it was also a very important moment for them to focus on um, that day, the, the, the loss in their life. Um, certainly people, and we know some people, some people unfortunately who have lost um, loved ones quite recently, um, and not to be able to say Kaddish. And if this is gonna continue as Rebbe Tin said for a very long time, you know, what, what would that look like? Um, so it was interesting to me because even before people know that Rav Malamed came out with a psak for a, a liberal orthodox shul in Tel Aviv, um, and Rav Benny Lau um, spoke about it. Um, so I, 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 was, I was interested in it only because for a very long time, um, I've been looking at the nature of the various Kaddishes that we say in the Tuch, um, our, our philo, um, for many years actually. Um, not only um, like how it separates the Torah service, how it separates how morning Kaddish to Rabbanan. Um, clearly we know here um, amidst this incredible panel, um, we know that mourner's Kaddish is such a later Kaddish. Um, even initially it was de Rabbanan before it was turned over to be for the community. It was really for the rabbi of the community, you know, and, and then later on, it kind of just morphed um, and morphed and morphed. Um, and um, given that, it was so late. Um, and the question of um, who constitutes a quorum, what constitutes a voice or place um, is really up for great debate, as Rav Danny said initially, like this is not just a, you know, yes, no answer. Um, so because of the differing opinions that are out there, I, I took it very seriously. And people were asking for Devarsha Pekadusha, which, you know, it initially came up in terms of um, when we were doing the Megillah Esther. Because I wanted to, I was thinking about whether or not um, we do the bracha at the end, Haravet Ridenu. I had over 200 people listening to my Zoom Megillah, right? Doing, participating. Um, do I do Haravet Ridenu? In the end, I had the person do it without Shem Hashem, but it didn't feel right because I felt there was like a quorum, there was a gathering of Rovama Adrat Pnei Melech that we had like all these people there 
it seemed, it seemed like a gathering, but there is a sense of the physical presence of a minion to be able to say those things, to be able to say it constitutes a Devarship of Kedusha, um, that you could say a Devarship of Kedusha. So in terms of what Rav Malamed said, and, and I gave a whole hour share on this, so I don't wanna um, steal all this time. I do, I do just wanna say that what Rav Malamed said, um, I thought was very thoughtful. Um, and I felt given the need for other individuals in the community um, to be able um, to satisfy that need. Um, and it was a need. And it was a tsar for them not to be able. Some people view Kaddish differently. Um, and so I made it very clear to say um, what Rav Malam had said, what, in far as it being a bracha levatala to say it, it's not. Our, our davening, the reason Rav Asher said it's a minion, it's not a minion. Um, we don't have, I mean, we, we get a minion of people gathered. I want to have a minion of people gathered to be able to answer um, to the mourner's Scottish. However, in terms of the tefillah itself, which is much more antiquated and much older and much um, more, I want to preserve that. Um, even though Rav Malamed said you could do Baruch Hu because that was later and not a part of, I, I, I felt very strongly I want to keep it separate. And I'll tell you why in a sec. I wanted to keep that separate from the Mourner's Kaddish. The Mourner's Kaddish, I felt because it was later and it doesn't constitute a, a bracha levatala, that it would be an opportunity for people to be able to have a sense of community in that way, um, to be able to satisfy that need. Um, and those people who have a yard site once a year, or even for the people who are involved in Yedbet Chodesh, um, I thought that it was very important to have that. The reason um, that I am concerned about doing something Dvar Shepikadusha for Tefillah, even though I think that you could say Baruch you could say Yid Gimel Midot, there is really a way to do that. And there is a Shita, there is Al Meli Smoke, there are a few. And I, and I feel that in this time, I really wanted to go with that Psak. The reason I didn't is because, similar to what Rabbi Ethan said earlier, um, what's going to be after? And people were very concerned. What is it going to be after this? It's gone, right? Like, Let's get rid of going to shul. Let's get rid of like, if people can come in this way. And I made it very clear when I wrote to my community about it, that this is a shat tachak, that it's um, in this situation, we're going to be very mindful of trying to accommodate those people who could benefit greatly from having a minion there. And with that, um, do our best to accommodate them with the knowledge that Bezrat Hashem, when the pandemic is over, um, we will not... Um, be considering this leniency, and it is a leniency. Um, anyway. Thank you. Uh, Rav, Land Rav Landis, I know you, we've talked a little bit about this, and you have some, uh, I don't know, it was a fascinating view of a sort of a broader... Well, this is the first thing I want to say, that if uh, Rav Ethan is right, this might even go to a second Pesach, isolated. I am not turning the house chavitz. I'm going to be pace dick for the entire year. <laughs> Can't go through this again. This is ridiculous. I say this uh, also, actually, more seriously, or more foreboding. We may, there's a part of us that could very well take what's happening this pandemic as, as a <laughs> terrible thing, but a harbinger of what might happen when the environmental crisis hits. So everything we learn is very important right now for this occasion, but for other possible occasions, law, lane, et cetera. So this is what I want to say this thing. I'm actually very pro the whole thing with the minion and that, and this comes for the fact I would for what I would say is we have a certain experience, Jewish people, of being uh, with having something done virtually. We're the ones who came up that we're going to dive and always towards Rushlayim to a certain spot. I mean, I think that's that's our Kiddush and that we're there. Our liturgy either has us in the base of Mikdash and sometimes in the base of Mikdash and even in, you know, virtually in Shemayim with the angels when we do Kedusha. Um, I mentioned my great grandfather again. He was asked by Rev Herzog. What do you do for people on army base regarding Kriyas Megillah? Uh, Megillah, he said, absolutely, you could use a microphone. And he added, you could even use a telephone. This goes back to 1952 or 1953, something like that. Because as long as there's no real hefzeh between the person reciting it and the shamia, the hearing, there's a whole question of lapse of time, but there's no real lapse of time. When you're, when you're alive, it's 
is happening right there, I think. And I have somebody on my side, even though you might not know he's on the side, of Moshe Sturbach, who's the Abbasin for the Ada Haredes, Paskin on a case in uh, Brooklyn, where everyone went out in their balconies, and only two people were standing by the Sefer Torah on one balcony. Everyone's in different balconies. They could kind of see each other. They could hear each other. They could hear the voice and all that. And he called up, this is, I forgot his name, uh, Belzerfuss. He called up people from the different balconies for Aliyahs. There's a grandis. Not exactly. Now, when you're on, when you're on a good Zoom, you're hearing the, the, the call. There is not like this webinar kind of thing, but you see the people that you're, everyone else that you're, you're dealing with. I think, you know, I'm for, okay, of course, Shasav Chaka, but I'm for us exploring and knowing how to survive spiritually on this, uh, on this notion of using, uh, of knowing what it is to be a virtual, a virtual individual, a virtual, a virtual community. I'm for it. Any bad? Wow. Oh. Okay, Ravitha, and, and you don't have to always take the traditionalist point. Of view. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it actually really reinforces what uh, or Ablandis is saying, what, what feels to me is sort of at stake here, which is how much are we in uh, a new environment where I think there's no question, right? I mean, the way I think about this is, if we colonize Mars, does Judaism go there? Right. In other words, there, there's a certain response where you say, no, it only works on planet Earth. Now, there was an earlier time in our history where pretty clearly we thought it only works uh, in Eretz Yisrael. Uh, right. When, when David Amelech says, you know, Gershuni ayom, benachalat Hashem, and there I am on uh, Elohim And there we are uh, at, the, uh, at the outside of the boundaries of the land. There's no way the system can work here. Uh, and we overcame that and developed, you know, some version of that. I'd say we mostly came to terms with Judaism in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, though that still has some lingering uh, pieces we haven't totally figured out. Uh, you know, but can, could you do this in a place where the sun doesn't rise in the same way? Now, that's a deep question. You know, I mean, Christianity answered this question on its terms a long time ago and was, you know, shover et kol akelim in order to make the point that this was uh, a potentially universalizable covenant. We rejected that route. Um, but in that sense, I think that's the question to me. I have no question that in our DNA is some sort of tension between this Brit has to be universalizable in some fundamental way to circumstances beyond the ones we can currently imagine. But we are also resistant at doing that in a sort of wholesale reevaluation way. Uh, yeah, to the extent that you told me, people for the next 60 years were gonna be locked up in their houses and it would be like, yeah, we're just gonna actually not have uh, you know, any Dvarim Shabi Kedusha, anything. It's very hard to imagine uh, saying that you're not going to rethink the questions. Um, and then there's the question of, okay, but how much even in this reality do we feel that there is something incredibly powerful about being in the same space? I mean, look, to me, and, and that we lack that right now, right? And that that's reflected in our ritual expression. So, I mean, it seems to me, I, I tend to be drawn to kind of thinking of these in sort of dueling archetypes. And I think it really comes down to the Gemara and Psachim where this all comes together. It's basically Rav versus Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi in their pure archetypes. You know, Rav is mina agaf elachutz kelachutz v'chein letfilah. Really, when someone walks out of a shared space with you, you do not have the kind of ability to bring God's presence down to earth in the same way, which is ultimately, I think, a manifestation of that energy that you feel when someone walks in the room. I mean, it's the energy I now feel when I'm going on, you know, walks outside in the neighborhood and you see someone, it's like someone you're not even that good a friend with and you're, you're overwhelmed, you know, by their tzelem elokim, by the presence of God in some way. I think that's actually something of what the mina agaf elachutz kelachutz standard is capturing. And then you got Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi there who is saying, you know, a filu chomat barzel, you know, even an iron wall can't divide people from God. What, God doesn't know we're on Zoom here together right now? I mean, please, right? So 
I think on some level, that's, that's where I'm feeling the tension. If you ask me to just think of it from HaKadosh Baruch Hu's perspective, um, and perhaps us catching up to that, of course, a virtual world, to the extent it becomes our reality, has to be as valid. And then there's the sort of fleshy human being part of me uh, that actually feels the pain of not being in the physical proximity of other people. And is like, maybe part of the way I act that out is like, I don't say Kaddish. But I think the really tough, so, you know, we have my mother-in-law's yard site coming up. It's the first day of Pesach. Um, and, you know, we're not gonna, we're not gonna have a Kaddish. Um, and sort of, you know, my wife has kind of come to terms with that's what it's gonna be this year. No one thinks that's great, um, to put it mildly. <laughs> Um, I think the other thing with this moment is, I'm sure everyone agrees on this, um, we have to sort of, I have a real kind of mentality on this, which is to say, everyone's doing their best. Everyone's trying to figure out <coughs> what makes sense in unforeseen circumstances. If we do it l'shem shamayim, it's going to be okay on the other end, as long as we're humble enough to realize, yeah, we're going to make the wrong call this way or that way on a bunch of these questions. Wow. Um, so I... Um... Beautiful, um, everyone. I want to, uh, and that, thank you. That gives a lot of cover. So uh, I'm going to run with it. Uh, uh, but um, so I do have, uh, you know, I have another small question and then the big question. So let me, uh, Ravith and Tucker, I'll, I'll start with you. No, and, but I, I have a drush. Oh. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> as long as that put in the hands of those who want to destroy it all. Amen. So I like with you. I like it. I like it. Amen. <laughs> the balance. The balance. Okay. Uh, the balance. <laughs> uh, so uh, a um, you know it's interesting. Again, a tough issue. Mikvah. And what do we do if the mikvahs close? And what do we do with our? You know, speaking of relations uh, with husband and wife and and. Uh, spouses, what do we do uh, with that? Um, and I just want to make sure I'm going to double it up. I don't know if they go together well, but this question of, of triage of like, God forbid, what happens? Uh, do you with, with um, do we uh, should doctors give preference to people who are relatively healthy, who can they think can survive? Or do they just treat every patient that comes in? Uh, equally, you know, the, the normal triage, I believe, is the one that needs the most care right away, the most injured, uh, the most desperate. Um, but from what I've heard, you know, there are decisions that were made in, elsewhere in the world that were really, no, this person probably won't make it, might not make it, I'm not going to treat them, I'm going to prioritize someone else. So uh, we have 15 more minutes, I want to make sure we get everyone some time. Um, so you're well. You're welcome to deal with that however you want. These okay, two. that those feel like two. That's definitely two questions. I'll try to say something very briefly about both of them. Maybe we'll have time for uh, for another round. Uh, yeah, in terms of mikvah and tevila. So you know, obviously, there's a lot of debate over what's safe, what's not safe. I, I'm. I want to answer it or reflect from the perspective. If one were to assume that it is unsafe. Okay, which is being debated. But in other words, if one reached the conclusion, whether personally, communally, medically, uh, that it is no longer safe, uh, you know, to, to go and do a tevila in an institutional mikvah. So obviously, okay, there's all the things we can say about natural bodies of water and other options and other possibilities. Um, here too, you know, I think I, I would just say two things quickly and we can elaborate on it. Um, the first is, um, when you're talking about something that's for a short period of time, or you're talking about something where it's a difficult period. So yeah, the notion that, uh, the notion that one of your responses might be uh, that life does not go on as normal, um, and that you're not able to do certain things that you otherwise would be able to do. Um, I, I don't think that should be dismissed out of hand, right? In other words, that, that is one potential response, and Mishnat Avon and all sorts of things, uh, you know, about, about that. Um, and then on the other hand, right, I think I, and I'm hopeful that actually this crisis will turn us to, uh, can you still hear me? Sorry. Yeah. I think yeah. my mic went out. Great. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, um, that the, that this will turn us to, you know, evaluating, uh, certain questions that I think have been put on sleep mode, which is what is the actual validity of 
municipal water systems? What is the actual validity of Tvila that you know can happen in a home? Um, you know, flowing water, the the municipal water system having the status of a yam, um, there being the possibility of the metaher bezochalin, all kinds of things that are sort of technical areas of mikvaot. Um, I would prefer us to sort of, instead of saying, well, that's it, everything has to be thrown out, to instead say, are there, is this inviting us to, you know, imagine different angles of what might be a, a valid tevila um, alongside thinking about, okay, how do you manage sort of short-term crisis? There's a lot more to say on that, but I, I want to take up more time. Uh, as far as the, the triage question, here's the, I, I don't feel like I have full clarity on it, but I, I will say this. It strikes me that one of the things that is that creates uh, some of the most acute triage problems um, is this is going to sound odd, but is electricity. <laughs> By which I mean we set up. It's actually the same thing with like uh, fire and gas stoves on Yom Tov. We have set up in our contemporary world um, the possibility to feed energy basically, sort of limitlessly into various machines that help people and keep people alive, such that putting someone on a ventilator is no longer, I am now working on focusing on actively keeping this person alive uh, for the next three hours. And then when I take a break, I'll decide what I do next, but it now becomes taking someone off a ventilator who has been attached, which is to say, we have a total blurring of, uh, you know, sort of pikuach nefesh and what it is, and, and the chashash and the of ritzicha, okay, of actually actively killing someone, with the question of lota amod al damareecha, which has always been a resource-based question in halacha. That is to say, if I'm now sitting here at my table, um, no one says that I am over lota amod al damareecha because I am not deciding to fly across the world and feed someone who's hungry. Maybe Peter Singer thinks that, but lota amod al damareecha was never conceived in that way. But when you have the sort of almost endless possibility um, of you know continuing to operate a ventilator without human interaction, and it becomes about withdrawing the support. This becomes the challenge. So I, I, it seems to me, I think people are trying to do this. I think Rav Schechter at YU has been trying to do this. Can you talk about uh, the notion of putting someone on support and getting resources as almost being like altnai from the beginning mm. for a certain amount of time and then subject to reevaluation? But it's very tricky. And I am uncomfortable with the full on race to utilitarianism under the cloak of halacha when it comes to wearing the human life question. And to the extent that that means sometimes, I don't know, it might be a case where it's like, yes, this person's 70, but they're not <laughs> worth less than someone who's 20. I, I don't know. I'm still very confused about it, but that's some of what I'm feeling. Uh, Rav Landis, I'll, I'll go to you. I first have to say, Ethan, and I've said this already to a doctor, I'm 69 and a half. <laughs> so before you take me off, I feel like a five-year-old says I'm five and a half. I'm 69 and a half. You got to wait. No, so, you know, having been involved in just piske halacha, just in the trenches on, uh, on these issues, I do also want to have mortality to machines. You know, machines that periodically turn off. So then, then hard decisions, but decisions can be made. And uh, that should be able to be done. So that's just, I mean that in dialogue on that, on that issue, and I'll leave it at that. The machines have taken over, and it's a, it's a, big, it's a big problem. Uh, on, the, uh, on the mikvah issue, I think one of the things that we need to do is as we see the options, uh, be able to explain and give people the options. A revered teacher of mine got very upset with, uh, with the notion that uh, people may delay having sex for a while. He's, uh, in that sense, he's uh, a great person, also a great modernist, religious, certainly a religious man, but a great modernist. How can you, de you know, how can you deny anybody sex? I wanna say, you, you're not married. People deny sex all the time. You know, in other words, there are things that happen in life. And we do have, and it should be mentioned here, the rabbis here are all familiar with it, the Talmud in uh, 
in Tanit, uh, Yud Aleph, 11, that says, how, are you, how can you have intimacy in a time when people are falling over and dying? I mean, you know, how can you do that? I don't say that, therefore, is the argument that everyone has to follow that direction. But we have to make it a dignified a right. dignified kind of decision. And I think that's also true with the, the, uh, with the, with the water flow and with other questions, which, which I really, and I haven't been able to fully answer it for my own satisfaction. I, I, I took in my a younger part of my, a woman who could not, who was about to get married, and she could not be in a, a body of water. There was some sort of susceptibility to the bacteria that was immediately life-threatening. And uh, we, you know, we were in California, so we went to uh, a waterfall, myself and my wife, and she wore loose clothing, and there was something, can a, can a shower be this way? I don't know, but we're going to have to think imaginatively of what that experience uh, means, including the fact is those things which are temporary ways of going, those may, those which may be harbinger of the future. Uh, the humility of Hurachum, the humility of that, but make those things into the possible experience and hear the humility of uh, we all have to be humble. I mean, we're forced to be humble by the situation, but we're also forced to be humble by our text. It's right for our for those who listen to us, and God knows why they listen to us, I think sometimes. Those who listen to us, it's they have a right to be healthy, and they have a right to be able to discharge, and this goes to a lot, discharge their spiritual needs, their spiritual needs. I have to say this. So I talked to a, a good little Torah on the Haredi side of cousin, and he was still talking to me. And he says, ah, oh, Kaddish Yosem, this is like what the Dina was saying. Kaddish Yosem, what is it? It doesn't even, it's not even like Harosis. That's what he said. So I, I, I knew something. I said to him, Oh, I remember your, your Bobby's Charosis. He talked for 10 minutes about his Bobby's Charosis. And then he says, and my daughter-in-law knows how to make it. So I said, so maybe sentimentality is, is something in Judaism. Maybe it is part of the human thing that in terms of just a, he says, Efsher, he said to me, Efsher, which I took as a validation. Maybe, maybe. All right, I said enough. Rabasher. Uh, so, Rav, Rav Dina, uh, Rav Nyman, uh, okay. both so issues. I'll talk about I'll talk about mikvah first, okay. um, and I can tell you that um, since this since this started, both on the international level and on the um, local level, um, I've I've had to deal deal with a lot of issues in terms of mikvah. That's first. Second, um, in terms of bioethics, in terms of triage. Unfortunately, I had to. Um, speak to several doctors about that as well. So I, I, I'm, like, I, I, I love the theoretical, and not only the threat, no one's talking theoretical, people are dealing with these questions on the side. But I want you to know that I, this question, unfortunately, unfortunately, unfortunately um, I, I've had to give great thought thinking to, and I, I just want to, um, if you can just indulge me to talk mikvah, and, and I'll just give you lemaisa. Okay, so in terms of mikvah, um, Things might be a little, actually, Israel has followed in a great way because I was following what was going on in Israel, what's going on here. Not every mikvah um, is going to follow the rules and guidelines um, that have been put in place. Um, the CDC, people have sent articles that what if the water is going to be able, it, it could, could transmit some kind of COVID to another person. The CDC has demonstrated that it, has, it is not. The level of chlorine, the level of bromine has been raised so high that actually I, I suggested a number of weeks ago that even though people are no Hague after mikvah to not shower, I don't, that they should that that may not be lifted because not so much because of the, of potentially um, getting the virus, but because the bromine level is so high, it, it really could hurt the skin or our chlorine level is too high for the skin. So I, I, I want to talk about the safety of mikvah. First of all, if you put into place the proper safety, nothing is risk-free, nothing. Going to the store is not risk-free. People need to. And you talk about sentimental need, I'd say emotional need. Um, you have people, who are in the middle of fertility treatments. A lot of clinics have 
fertility clinics have closed, but people already began the process of these treatments. And so they're continuing on with those. They cost a huge amount of money, but aside from that, the emotional, everyone knows the emotional weight of fertility treatments and what that means for a couple. There are also other situations that go on the couple and everything is case by case with this, that couples sometimes need to go to mikvah. There's the other side, people who are frightened, they're scared to go out. I have someone in my community who, whose doctor told her, given her medical condition, she's a young woman, that she shouldn't go out at all, not even to mikvah, to anything. So with that, in a moment, I'm going to talk about what we do with those people who cannot go to mikvah. But if someone says they don't feel comfortable or safe going to mikvah, the answer should be, you shouldn't go. And the answer should be, we are going to support you in our community for not going. There are people who also, unfortunately, have tested positive. Those people should not be having relations with their spouse. Those people should be encouraged to have, if, unless the spouse, whatever, I don't know what's going on there. But there should be isolation. You should be Carefully, you should be mindful of what that is, aside from the fact that you shouldn't bring that outside, aside from that. And obviously the dangers, not only, and now we're not only talking about the individual, I'm doing this very fast. We're not only talking about the individual, we're talking about what happens at the mikvot. We have, we have balaniot, but we also have the people who are cleaning our mikvot. So if you put the proper um, restrictions in place, I would say, is it a necessary thing to go, like essential, like to go to the, to the store? to go to the drugstore. For some people, it is very much a need in their family. Some people are living in very small apartments. Some people really need to be able to pass things back and forth, which I'll say in a moment. And though, I, if it's okay for me to go over just a little bit, Rav Asher. Um, yeah, Justin, I don't know how webinars work, so I hope uh, Zoom doesn't cut us off. Okay, but. so so I just wanna say the, the case of um, making sure that people are safe going to mikvah is on our community, is on us, making sure that there are um, routine filtering, it's constantly going. The balaniot is around, uh, balaniot, they should be standing around 10 feet distance with masks, with gloves. People should not prep in the mikvah. People should just go right in the mikvah and leave. And those individuals should not exchange money. It should be done. We could do a lot of things virtually now. That should be done. Also, we have to be very mindful of those, of, in terms of water um, exchange, again, the CDC said it has not it, and, and going into a, a body of water, certainly now in New York, Israel I know is a little different. In New York, the water's still very cold. There are concerns of hypothermia. There are concerns of people, um, it, it snowed last week. There are concerns of, of cardiac, like shock. Like if these are, and what's brewing in the water? We don't know. And, and to put someone in that, um, potential sakana they shouldn't do it. So to say that it's risk-free is wrong, but to put in proper standards, we can do, and we can make sure that it's spaced in a proper and, and safe way. If people aren't going, um, I suggest that harchakos are being reevaluated um, for those individuals. Um, I'm not saying, I think that we need to preserve um, not having sex when, there's need, when someone's in nida, but I do believe that the harchakos can be lifted um, except for, I would say, nishika, um, for kissing, that I think that people can touch and, and hug. This is a time you need support from spouses. Um, and I think passing things, those things, I think Durabanan we need to consider. Um, in terms of um, saving a person to save another, the Tzitzeliezer, if it, people are interested, um, wrote a very important thing, and, and it speaks to Rav Ethan's idea about utilitarian, right, versus um, egalitarian. Um, ethics in terms of how do we um, prioritize. And we also have Rav Moshe's um, Shiva that we can definitely rely on once someone is hooked up to a, um, to a, a ventilator. It is a case by case in any case of bioethics. Bioethics alone, bioethics with halacha, you have to look at every case. And to see that a person is 70, 80, um, 90, um, I know people who are in their 90s who are able to come off a ventilator already. Um, that, that is not something um, we don't, uh, we're looking at a person, we're thinking about how can we um, help people have um, value each person's dignity of life. And I don't think that we can weigh one against the other. Um, you, you mentioned about doctors and how doctors can also be, um, they should be given proper um, um, uh, you know, masks and to be able to treat us and we should be taking care of them as well. Um, but everyone, I think, um, should be looked at, every situation should be looked at case by case. And I think that we have to be very careful um, when someone is hooked up to a ventilator to reevaluate 
um, and not jump to conclusions, even though there's scarcity of resources, um, because, um, because every life has infinite depth. So thank you. So we're, we're going to wrap up. I do want to give everyone just 30 seconds. Uh, if you could just give us some, uh, maybe divrei chizuk or something to give us some strength and uh, let us get into Pesach and to all the practical cleaning and cooking and uh, designing our seders. Uh, so uh, we'll start with uh, Rav uh, do you want to start? Oh, you're still, uh, uh, can anyone hear me? Oh, I wonder if we're, okay, yeah. So Rav Danny, uh, whoever can hear me. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I had a whole mahalach on this now, but uh, we're allowed parts of brokenness. You know, we break, break that matzah on Seder night, and if you're in a home in which a spouse has lost her spouse, his spouse, they know what brokenness is. You don't have to say much. But overall, we can't be miyayish. We're an old religion. You know, we don't always do it right, but we must have been doing something right. And we have an old father in heaven. And uh, we all need to do the, do the right thing. You know, it's called a voda for a reason. It's not service. Oh, you want to abort? This is a big problem in modern Judaism. They call it services, <clears throat> translating a voda. So they say, Rabbi, you didn't give me good service, but you call it work. People want to show up for work. And that's what it is. This is the avoda. It's work. But okay, it's a great thing to work. You know? I'll finish with the last rabbi of the twenty of the twentieth century, the great rabbi of the twentieth century, Sigmund Freud. You know, to be an adult is to work and to love. We gotta do the avoda and we gotta love and it's okay they ask for love also. Thank you. Uh, Ravdina. Oh, I'm we're getting uh, on mute. Sorry. There you go. Yeah. I, I've been thinking a great deal only because we spoke about this last week um, about Haroset. Um, of, we've been doing some Mishnahis with the Kila. And I think that the idea of the bittersweetness of, the, of this time period is critical. Um, everything in the Seder, um, the, the Haroset, um, um, masks the, the bitterness. Um, in and of itself, it represents a bitterness. Um, when you look at, at, at the dipping of the carpas, it's in the salt water. Um, we're eating lachamoni, yet we're free. Um, we're singing halal, and we have this ge'ula, but we still don't have the ultimate ge'ula. I think that often when we're planning this and we're sitting and people are thinking about, oh, I don't have the Seder that I'm used to. I'm, not, I'm missing my family. I'm missing my friends. I won't be able to stay a yard site. I won't be able to, I won't be able to say Kaddish in a yard site. I won't, and, and these are real difficulty. And so I think in many ways, um, built into the Seder is coping mechanisms, our coping mechanisms for life, for what it means not only to be a Jew in this life, right? But to also understand that a Kaddish Baruch Hu took us out you know, la ora, right? Um, but even with that, it was tricky. Um, and by the way, there's there's a, a sensitivity, there's a there's a trickiness to be able to be um, saying my avdut la knowing that people died so that we would have chayrut um, with uh, with kriyas yamsuf, and that's why we don't say halal the second uh, the after the first days of yantiv. And and I and I feel that um, it's not something that we have to. Um, say, oh, woe is us, because we don't have always a perfect utopic life and everything is, what we could say is, appreciate the Shefer Brachot that you have in your life and hold each other dear and um, help each other get to the next stage. Um, and that is the longing of Leil Shimurim. That's the longing to get to the next, um, the hope, the anticipation. That's how we understand, the Rashbam understands Leil Shimurim. It's the anticipation. It's God anticipating, it's us anticipating. And hopefully with that, we can continue um, to be able to motivate each other. Thank you. And Rav Ethan Tucker. Yeah, uh, just say thanks so much for bringing us together. You know, I think one of the things that um, is obviously so difficult about this Pesach is the isolation. Um, and I've been trying to just think about the ways in which a silver lining isn't quite the right way to do it, but actually even focusing on my own spiritual state and the parts of it that have been uh, felt strong and uplifting, even as there's so many parts that are 
uh, that are tough. And the Seder is a funny thing that way. It, we think of it as the ultimate uh, you know, family and gathering holiday, and it is, and even in the Torah itself, right? If the house is too small to bear a lamb, you're supposed to come together with other people. And yet the sort of core paradigm that the whole thing works on is like actually each home is its own thing. Um, and there's something extremely powerful there, which is, I think, Dafka, what people often tap into on the Seder, which is everyone actually in a certain way does this on their own. Now, on their own doesn't mean alone in an apartment. And for the people who are grappling with that this year, it's immensely painful. But there is a way I would love for us to try as much as we can, as much as we're in the physical and mental health to do so, uh, to tap into the power that comes from doing things on our own. And I think it is true to the spirit of what it is to be a mamlechet koanim v'goy kadosh, which is the idea that we actually don't think this is about institutional spaces alone or about priests or rabbis who do things for us. Like we need those spaces, but on some level the dream is, can you create a world where yeah, everyone knows how to get up every morning and how to daven. And when you're not able to be at a Kriyat Torah, you read the Parsha to yourself and you read the Haggadah and you force yourself actually as an act of learning and growth uh, to be able to own some of these things. That's my hope and my bracha that we come out on the other side of this with at least some sense in addition to the, disor you know, the disorienting feel of more people have a personal connection and ownership of the mitzvot, which, okay, you got 80% right because you never did this before and that before. Um, but in a sense that you feel like it's yours, right? You're not just following along someone else's script. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you for your, the strength that you've given me and I'm sure everyone here and continue to give to Am Yisrael. And it should be... Uh, God willing, next year, Lashana Bab Yushalayim and Lashana Abba, we should be out of this pandemic and uh, everything good. Achad Kasha Vesamech. I'm so great. Abasha, thank you for leading, leading the way and convening this conversation. But everything that you do, um, you. what you're doing in Detroit, we miss you greatly. But thank you for all you're doing for Kal Yisrael. And uh, we really. Amen. Thank you. Yes, thank you. 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 Good yantif to all. Good yantif. Good yantif.